Hi everyone, this is Jack Mulqueen, nightlife operator in New York City and writer of Nightlife Noir, a new book that is available now on Kickstarter. You are listening to Two Geeks Talking with Kurt Sasso. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented individual known as a nightlife mogul and, of course, the city that never sleeps, New York. Uh, he has created an amazing comic series called Nightlife Noir. We are joined today by the ever-talented Jack McQueen. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm wonderful, Kurt. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. You know, I love bars. I love going out every so often as, as I could, you know, a couple of years ago before a pandemic. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you become the mogul that you are? Well, uh, it all really started, I guess, uh, at the great university of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, there's an old quote by Mark Twain that says, never let school interfere with your education. And um, so while I was there, you know, beyond my uh, prolific studies, that's a, a joke, by the way, uh, I was uh, spending a great deal of time DJing and, uh, and, and producing, independently producing uh, concerts uh, on weekends that the student body would, would uh, participate in. Uh, parlayed that into a, a brief foray in the music industry after college. Um, which was interesting. I, I likened myself to the coolest broke person that I knew, uh, you know, that, uh, artist credential for Coachella and I couldn't pay my rent. Uh, and that that's kind of, I guess, uh, very much, you know, what the entertainment industry is all about. Fake it till you make it, smoke and mirrors and whatnot. And um, on the weekends, I started uh, throwing parties in, in the city and, um, Despite the fact that I was spending about 80% of my time working my day job and 20% of my time uh, uh, producing and promoting these parties on the weekend, my income was closer to 50-50. So naturally, my time gradually started, you know, uh, skewing more towards that. Um, and I had a brief stint in, uh, in the Hamptons. I, I was the talent buyer and artist liaison uh, for a pop-up nightclub in the Hamptons. Uh, booked a really cool roster of talent, Grammy Award uh, 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 winning artists, um, you know, uh, just like very, like a very diverse and um, and uh, prolific group of artists that we were able to kind of feature over there. And on the heels of that, uh, opened a an, my first nightclub in the city, which was called Nighty Night, uh, and that was in inside of a uh, like basically like a converted storage room inside of a hotel in the meatpacking district which at the time was like the uh eminent uh nightlife district in lower manhattan <clears throat> and that was uh that, that was really like my first time you know getting a hand of managing a space uh operating a space and it it, it, but it, but it was also I didn't really have the resources that I needed in order to truly succeed. So it was actually like a pretty short stint over there, and then um, the hotel came under new ownership and and just uh, uh, eradicated all of their F and B components and kind of started over. Uh, but I had learned learned enough from that uh, brief uh, tenure to uh, go off and, and start my own business. So I opened up a, a little bar on the Lower East Side called the Black Lodge. Uh, and then on the heels of that opened up a rooftop uh, cocktail lounge called Make Believe, which is inside of a 60 LES hotel. Um, and now, you know, it's really interesting. I was just speaking to a friend at lunch earlier and I said, you know, despite the hardships that this past year presented, I think that we're also entering a very unique moment uh, in New York City where there's a great deal of opportunity uh, abound in the streets right now. For the first time, it seems like there's been a um, uh, just unfortunately a lot of brick and mortar businesses that have that have closed, and a lot of commercial and retail uh, rent spaces that are available on the market right now. Um, and so you're seeing uh, really great deals out there for very unique spaces, which is something that me as like a voracious uh, hunter of new opportunities. Um, 
I just really haven't found very, anything to my liking over the past couple of years. And then all of a sudden the pandemic comes around and you've got a lot of uh, great spaces on the market right now. So I think that we're entering something of an expansion uh, period of sorts. Um, you know, so it's, it's funny that they say that it's always darkest before the dawn. And I, and I feel like we're, we like the hospitality industry is kind of, uh, experience, uh, that right now where we, you know, it's been in a, for the entire industry, uh, and all of my peers, the entire, like the whole category, um, have really suffered over the last 16 months. But, uh, coming out of that, I think that, you know, those who were fortunate enough to survive have learned a you know, a great deal of lessons in terms of becoming a more shrewd and disciplined operator. Um, and I think that, you know, coming out, I, I, I think that we're seeing now a groundswell of uh, a creativity that was long dormant during the pandemic starting to uh, emerge. And so I, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to see what the 2.0 uh, version of the hospitality industry in New York City will will look like. One of the, one of the most interesting aspects of, of when you schedule this interview was, you know, the fact that you've made all of these businesses and now you're making comics. I mean, that's a heck of a transition from the creative person, from a business perspective that you are, especially with managing and managing people and businesses and getting patrons to come to your establishments. But how does your skill sets transition to comic book creation? Yeah, so it all kind of began at the onset of the pandemic. I think that, um, you know, I think that I, 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 I've joked with my fiance recently that this year um, my bank account was empty, but my heart was full. And, uh, this, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of people I've spoken to lament that this was a lost year, they call it. Um, and that makes me really sad because we're not getting that time back. And I, I wonder, but, but many people I've, who I've spoken to also say that this was an opportunity to kind of take inventory of oneself and determine uh, what is really important to you. What are the things in your, in your life and in your daily routine that you can do rid of? And sometimes it's very difficult to see the forest from the trees and we're so busy on our day-to-day -day basis uh, that that we can't really do any uh, spring cleaning per se of, of the things that are important uh, in our lives. And I think during the pandemic, all of a sudden, when we were when we were forced by necessity to uh, adjust our routines, for the first time, we were able to kind of like distance ourselves from our from our day-to-day -day, uh, rituals and take stock in you know, what are the things that, that I really want to accomplish with uh, this incredibly scarce and limited time that I have on this plane of existence? Because life is sweet, but short for certain. And, and so comics uh, have, been, have long been a passion of mine. Um, I'm an avid consumer of comics. I really believe that the medium, uh, that, there, that there's some incredible stories being told um, in the medium. And during the pandemic, I closed down all of my businesses and I went up to our house in Vermont and I just started reading a ton, uh, reading a lot of prose, reading a lot of comics. And at one point, by some fortuitous uh, chance, I, I was on IGN and I saw an article written by Brian Michael Bendis mm -hmm. about um, five craft books that he recommended for anyone who was considering uh, starting a career in comics. And I was like, you know what, let me just, let me just order these books and, and, you know, check out the content, see, see whether it's for me. And uh, the books arrived, you know, a week or two later, and I devoured them. Uh, I went through all of them. And on the heels of that, I said, okay, I think I have an elementary understanding of um, uh, the technical aspect of the medium enough to kind of like take my first crack at writing and so for about three hours every single day i would i would go up uh, to my room and just start pounding away at the keyboard um pounding my head into a wall <laughs> and uh and, the creative process and um what came what came of it and and also sketching a lot because the 
initially the sketching, despite the fact that I'm terrible, uh, I'm, I'm a terrible artist, uh, but the sketching was really a useful tool for me to get into the headspace of thinking about like the economics of a, of a page um, and how to convey information on a page. Uh, it, it slowed down my my process quite a bit, but but I thought that that was uh, instrumental for my first for my first stab at it. Um, and what came of it was about eighty pages of um, hastily done sketches and a script that um, you know, despite despite being technically sound, the story was just like all over the place. And and that project will never see the light of day. But it was like a good a good tool for me to understand one very, very important thing for any um, uh, person who's starting up uh, creative writing or writing in fiction to grasp, which is if, if you give yourself a very narrow, uh, like very narrow parameters to work within, you know, operating within the parameters of genre, operating within the parameters of length, um, uh, minimizing your cast down to, a handful of important characters um, by by imposing limits upon yourself uh, you can tell a a deeper and more focused and concise uh, story and so I said okay let me go back to the drawing board with this and then obviously you know one thing that has been long uh, uh, explored is how the reason that com that that comics are such a a, a creative well uh, for many people is that when you're when you're starting out as a, as a as a creator as a writer, and you know, let, let's say that you wanted to make a short film or or a TV show, your uh, your budget would really constrain the type of story that you would be able to tell. And the thing is with comics, since it's art. And sequential art, uh, the the breadth of stories that you can tell with a relatively minimal budget is is far more expansive than any other genre. It's really the only limitation is your imagination, yeah. um, and there's so many incredible artists uh, all around the world uh, who are capable of 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 producing these uh, just breathtaking works of art um, that. To, that the the real economic limitations of the project are based on the page count, uh, because there's a certain labor and production cost affiliated with with uh, each individual page, and so that really informed my decision that my first project should be uh, a collection of short stories. And since um, you know, since nightlife is kind of what 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 is endemic to me and what people know me for, I thought that that would kind of be a good uh, starting point for me because um, I really believe in writing your own truth. And I thought that this was a particular, like, like a very exotic universe that I had a unique perspective into. And I thought that maybe that from my own experience, I could kind of tell some, some very compelling stories. And, and so that's how the project came about. But then, um, very early on, I determined that I wanted each story to be penned by a different artist so that they all had kind of like their own unique feel. And that was partially for me kind of exploring where does my writing fit into the equation? What works well with uh, my prose and my dialogue? What, what doesn't? And um, well, I'll, I'll leave that for my readers to, to ultimately determine what worked and what didn't. But um, it, it, it was it was a great joy uh, learning the collaborative process because it's such a collaborative medium. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the relationship between the artist, the writer, the letterer, and uh, and and the colorist. Um, I really uh, cherish uh, the collaborative process, and so. You know, within this one comic project are, is actually six comics, uh, you know, because there's six unique stories. And so to, to be able to establish, establish, you know, six unique relationships with each of my artist collaborators um, and kind of play editor also uh, in that respect in terms of managing the deadlines of each respective story, uh, uh, bridging the 
uh, inkers, with the colorists and the letterers and the production designer. Um, that was something that I really enjoyed because it was kind of like a crash course in uh, the art of making comics. The storyboards that you basically drew set up your pages, which helps an artist do their work. I mean, the fact that you took the time and same with short films or same with any films, a storyboard is a great way to direct a camera person or a cinematographer or your artist to this is how I'd like the story to go. How you create that is, of course, up to your skill set and your talent that, that you're drawing from. Looking at these the, these books that I have, which are beautiful, by the way. I mean, the, the colors are, are, are vibrant. The stories are, are engaging. I mean, you I'll, have to get, I'll have to get some print copies over to you because I actually have uh, like the color proofs right now oh. uh, here and they're fantastic. <laughs> they have a really great weight to them. So I'll, I'll make sure I get I get some out to you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I just I love the fact that you, you found the right artists for the right stories is what I'm going for, basically. You didn't stick to the United States specifically. You went all over the world for these artists. Well, how did you find uh, your artists and who were they per story, if you recall? Yeah, so Twitter was uh, uh, really the invaluable resource where um, I could kind of organize myself. Um, you know, you have to keep in mind that I, I, I was completely green um, going into this project. And, and so I didn't really have a, a I, I, and I still don't have an, a name in this uh, industry that carries any, any gravitas. Um, so that, that, that informed my decision. I said, I want to find uh, artists who are at the same kind of step in, in the journey as I am uh, in terms of their, their body of, of bodies of work. And obviously I was, since my body of work was nothing, I would be the, the least experienced, but uh, people who are kind of early on uh, in their journey as professional artists. And, um, and, and, and then for me, it became uh, about organization. So I have a list on Twitter of about 400 uh, names of comic creators. It could be letterers, cut, uh, colorists, inkers, um, and, uh, separate of that, I have uh, almost like a tangential document to that is is a list that I have uh, in my notes that I basically applied uh, one turn to each artist to kind of characterize them in terms of what I thought their their greatest strength was. Um, and so when I when I had the collection of six stories that I had that I had scripted, um, I went down that list and started putting out some feelers. You know, a lot of a lot of the um, you know a lot of the process of whether somebody can accept the work is based on what other projects they have going on concurrently. And I presented to them the deadline as well. And what I thought was very important for this project was since I was, since I was completely unproven and completely green to ensure that I could uh, guarantee the page rates of each of my collaborators. So I financed the en entire project ahead of time um, just to make sure that, you know, to, to give them peace of mind. Uh, that that they were going to be compensated uh, adequately for for uh, for this project, um, and I don't know by some fortuitous stroke of luck, I really think that each of these stories wound up uh, in the right hands, um, which to me is uh, is fantastic. And I actually I really genuinely couldn't picture any of these stories um, any other way. And I think that that's a testament to uh, the incredible work that was done by. Uh, each of the six um, artists who who um, inked the stories, uh, many of them did the colors themselves. I also had a fantastic colorist, uh, Alex Battle from uh, Barcelona, who worked on this project, um, and then was introduced by a pal named Sebastian from TKO Presents to uh, Manny Medeiros, who is a, a very senior um letterer and kind of like art director and production designer um and that was really interesting to learn a little bit more about uh kerning and and just like formatting uh the project so once all of the assets uh were complete in terms of inks and colors then the entire project went over to manny and he was the one who kind of put the book together uh that fits in, in that, that 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 will ultimately be in uh, in your hands that's and awesome. um, and then we're really fortunate to have uh, incredible cover work done by uh, Adam Gorham, who 
beyond being one of the eminent cover artists uh, in comics right now, uh, does a lot of incredible interior artwork. He's got an ongoing series right now at uh, Vault Comics called The Blue Flame, which is fantastic, uh, written by Christopher Cantwell, who's writing on Iron Man right now and wrote uh, Halt and Catch Fire, the, the AMC TV show. And you know Adam and and Chris have done an incredible job on that title, really using a uh, cosmic uh, superhero story to um, tell a, a very uh, intimate tale about uh, the intrinsic flaws within uh, humanity. And um, yeah, so I highly recommend that one. He also drew on Savage Avengers, which is one of my favorite ongoing titles at Marvel, uh, written by Jerry Duggan. So. Uh, it was great to to have um, you know his cover art because obviously covers are you know one of the biggest uh, uh, monetary uh, movers of a project um, because those are really going to be the main assets that uh, ultimately when push comes to shove people uh, will decide whether they want to purchase the book based on the covers and then and then from the interiors as well. Um, but I I certainly am I'm the type of person when I go. To the comic shop on Wednesdays, and I'm kind of perusing uh, uh, the aisles. If I see a cover that really catches my eye, that can oftentimes, regardless of what's in the interiors, be the determining factor of whether I want to want to add it to my collection or not. Comics have changed a lot over the decades. Obviously, when they first got printed in the in the 20s and 30s, uh, and even earlier for that matter, depending on the culture. Uh, to its current issue right now, we're we're now into digital comics. We're now into um, comic services where it's just a simple scroll up on your mobile phone. Like you, the interaction and consumption of comics is has, has changed vastly uh, since the physical medium itself. Um, obviously, it sounds like you still prefer the the physical copy. But do you do you do you digital comics as well? Do you just kind of flip through? Yeah, so I have uh, I have uh, all of the big publishing publisher apps um, on my iPad, uh, along with the comic Comicsology subscription and mm -hmm. Comicsology Unlimited subscription, because I, I I'm on the road quite a bit. Uh, so uh, rather than bring a bunch of floppies uh, in my backpack with me and potentially get them uh, damaged. Uh, that you know, the iPad has been a great uh, tool for me to continue reading uh, when I don't have the the privilege of you know being at home and and uh, stationary uh, with my collection. So so I do enjoy the digital comic. I think so. You know, it's really funny because during the pandemic, when I closed all uh, all of my businesses temporarily, um, you know, a lot of a lot of things you started notice, seeing where uh, industries were going digital. You know, you obviously have like the cryptocurrency boom. You have uh -huh. NFTs uh, that have kind of taken the art world by storm. Me personally, I am a very analog kind of guy. Like I don't understand uh, uh, the big picture. Maybe I should have paid more attention during during those classes. Um, but but I, I like tangible assets. Um, I, I've made a career thus far in building, uh, you know, living, breathing spaces within the parameters of four walls that people can come out and leave their homes and enjoy. Um, and so for me, uh, obviously, you know, digital to me is a convenience, um, but ultimately, uh, I, I really enjoy the tangible asset. And so that, that was a very conscious decision that I wanted this book to exist uh, in print. I wanted it to be something physical uh, that you could kind of hold in your hands and, um, you know, the, uh, and kind of thumb through the, the pages at your own leisure. Um, because I think that there, there's something very cathartic about that experience. So, yeah, that was very important to me. I think it, I think it harkens back to, you know, being a kid going into the, say, like a grocery store or something, seeing the floppies on, on a rack or whatever at your local convenience store and, you know, thumbing through it as your parents or whatever got their stuff. <laughs> at least that's how I experienced it. I'm not sure about yourself, but with this creative process, finally in print format, what's your next step as, as a creator? A lot of this project was, uh, at least for me personally, a desire to show proof of concept, um, to get a, a work out into the world, you know, start engaging with uh, other comic lovers uh, and 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 other creatives within the industry, um, 
and, and be able to share something with them uh, of, of my own creation. Uh, I've I found so far in my limited experience, uh, I've never been to a con or anything like that. I think New York Comic Con in October will likely be my first. And I've already got the wheels turning on how I can uh, host an after party uh, for that one for all the creators, maybe that yes. use the badge as a requirement to get in um, and and be able to, uh, you know, welcome, uh, welcome, like merge my comic life and my and my nightlife life uh, in in equal uh, measure. And I've always enjoyed playing the host. So that would, that would be um, very rewarding to me. I think it's actually very possible. Up in up here, up in Toronto for Fan Expo, um, they always have after parties always going on. No matter, it, it's almost like a four day event, basically at various clubs around Toronto. So one of the events that I've seen is they'll invite guests and fans if they dress up in their favorite cosplay. So some type of geek culture event or whatever might be perfect for one of your venues. So. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed. Maybe we'll do, I've got a couple of them. So maybe we'll do one with costumes required and, and one not. And that way we'll have a little something for everybody. And thankfully they're all within pretty close proximity to each other. So um, I can bop around between the two. I guess I'll just have to leave a, a costume in the storage. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, so that's something that's very exciting to me is just meeting other uh, people in the space because um, I remember somebody saying that, you know, one of the interesting about comics is that you really have to uh, seek out uh, this, this uh, industry. You know, you have to seek out uh, because of a genuine love for it. Um, and, and so I think that because of that, everybody is very earnest. You know, people come to it for, uh, you know, for the right reasons. Uh, they, they're drawn to comics. And in my, in my experience so far, everybody's been very, very welcoming, very accommodating, willing to impart whatever wisdom they can, very generous with their time and, and, and resources, connections. That's something that, that was a little bit of a culture shock coming from nightlife in New York City, which for some odd reason, you know, despite the fact that we have, you know, 14 million people here to pull from and all of the spaces are relatively small in scale, um, it tends to be very competitive, very insular. Uh, people are less like, less inclined to uh, share their resources. And certainly you see, you know, there's that expression, the New York Minute, which is, you know, ingrained within uh, the culture of this city is uh, the cadence and the breakneck pace of it. But uh, I think it's always important to remember, uh, you know, despite how fast things are going or despite how much you have um, going on to, to maintain that basic human compassion. So that's something that, uh, you know, comics are starting to rub off on me uh, once again uh, and, and starting to, you know, reinforce some, some you know, good habits of mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's, that's something that, that's always been amazing to me. So, so how the show got started was I interviewed people in the webcomic community back in the early 2000s. So talk about talking about, you know, creative people that the internet was brand new. Um, they're posting their comics with very little to no people why, viewing them except by word of mouth. So there's no real way to truly advertise properly you know, 20 years later, we're now in, in a technological age where everything is mobile, everything's available at the touch of a finger. So promoting yourself through shows like this, which I do greatly appreciate, um, and showing the passion that you have to tell your stories that you've gathered throughout your life and that you've, I'm sure, seen in, in your life through your various businesses, uh, to tell these stories is great to see because you're opening yourself which is well vulnerability as a writer is always very difficult especially to the masses what was your mindset when you were writing these stories how how vulnerable did you want to be to showcase your skills well you know they say that writing is very much uh just uh opening up a opening up a vein and seeing pouring it out holding it out over the page and seeing what comes out right and um and i think that you know, when growing up in the big city, uh, because I was born, born and raised in Manhattan, uh, you're exposed to uh, just such a wide variety of, of uh, people from all different walks of life and circumstances. And, 
you know, you see the, uh, you know, the, the glory of, of capitalism and commerce and, and then you see the, you know, the, the flaws uh, within uh, and, and the cracks within society uh, in equal measure, oftentimes uh, on the same on the same street, on the same sidewalk, you know, just people from all different breaths and walks of life. Now, my biggest um, I think that my biggest obstacle as a writer is my is my phone, because the, the more time that I spend looking down on my phone where I think that I'm consuming information is time that I'm spending away from being observant. Uh, and, and the more the, oftentimes when I put my phone away and I'm able to kind of like immerse myself back within uh, the city and be present and be observant and see what's going on. Well, I only need to take a walk down the street to, uh, to, to see just um, uh, like being like a full spectrum of, uh, of the human condition. And I spent a lot of time on, the, on riding the subway as well. Um, and, I, and I find that the subway, despite how uh, like, like, like intense it can be in terms of the aromas, um, in terms of the noise, in terms of the, the clutter, that it can also be something of a meditative experience because, you know, here you are, uh, uh, going, you know, let's say a hundred feet underground and you're stuck on this metal tube that's shooting at 70 miles per hour, uh, through a tunnel with, you know, 50 strangers, uh, of all different colors, class, and creed, uh, different ages. Everyone is at a different kind of, uh, step in their journey. And yet, in this moment, you are sharing this, uh, a, a space with them, a confined space with them. And then the doors open and they, uh, and they step off the tracks and, or, or step, step off uh, the, the subway car and onto, uh, you know, onto the platform and you're never going to see them again. It's, it's, it's very transient uh, in nature and kind of harkens back to, um, you know, complex society versus simplex society, you know, back in uh, feudal times, in the village, people like that. Your your banker was also your blacksmith was also the baker was also the uh, school teacher. You know, you had very complex relationships with each person within your village. Now we have very simplex relationships. Uh, they're very transactionary in nature. So uh, your banker is your banker. You, the, the grocery store clerk is the grocery store clerk, and those are that is the extent of your of your interaction with them. And I think that you know subways are kind of like um uh, kind of a, a, a great amalgamation of that but interesting to me is when i'm riding on the subways people tend to people for some reason are very vulnerable on there as well and in my observant state and this might sign, sound kind of voyeuristic or, or creepy but i actually like to uh uh imagine what is their backstory you know, what, what, what has brought them to this moment in time and envision kind of like what is going on in their life. And, and so it's like, it's almost like a character workshop uh, mm -hmm. of sorts that, that goes on in my, in my brain every time that I'm, that I'm cruising through on there. But to answer your question, because I just realized that I went off on a tangent. <laughs> um, with regards to the story, I would say that, yeah, a great deal of it uh, was pulled from personal experience and then kind of taking um, uh, these characters who I've encountered in my time and for the purpose of making it a, a good and compelling story, kind of like breaking it down into, um, you know, into a three arc type of structure with uh, a payoff. So, you know, I find it really interesting, um, you know, that Quentin Tarantino, when he did Inglorious Bastards, he kind of had this like, uh, in revisionist history that he that he participated in, where he gave uh, uh, the Jews and the Jewish soldiers this karmic victory that they couldn't be uh, afforded um, in real life by by killing uh, Hitler. Likewise with Django, you know, he was able to uh, write this revenge story for uh, a slave, somebody who had been you know, wronged in one of the worst ways that, that humans have ever come up with to wrong other humans. Um, but he was able to kind of uh, live out this revenge fantasy through, uh, through his works. And so that was something that I kind of envisioned was, um, you know, when, when I was crafting these stories, m many of which are 
uh, are are about based you know based loosely on former former employees of mine and uh, you know interactions that they've that that they've had with patrons or with the business itself in 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 many uh, respects to kind of give them that karmic retribution that I could tell that they so desperately uh, were seeking but um, you know within the pages I was able to 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 really to really grant them that so that was very gratifying for sure. Obviously, you're very well read. I can I can tell by not only the quotes, but also by the phrasing that you're bringing up. It sounds like you're into philosophy and among other genres as well. Uh, what was your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? Well, um, there was one that was actually uh, recommended by Alex uh, I might butcher the pronunciation, Pacnadal, Pacnadal um, who is the writer of uh, Giga, and he wrote, he recently wrote a one shot for um, The Immortal Hulk, which was excellent as well. And uh, once again, t talking about, you know, senior comics creators um, being so generous with uh, engagement uh, on Twitter that, you know, people really avail themselves uh, to answer questions uh, at a moment's notice. And, and so I, so I saw that he posted, um, you know, a photo that he had been kind of reorganizing his um, book collection. Uh, and so I asked him just off the cuff, uh, is there, you know, what would be the one book that you would recommend that currently appears like on your bookshelf? And he said, uh, Pilgrim Man, which was a really kind of um, uh, like a very metaphysical book about a Jew who was making a pilgrimage from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, basically like Bavaria, to um, Jerusalem during the Crusades. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had uh, recent, recently been castrated by a tax collector uh, uh, because he cuckolded his wife. Um, that's the premise. Uh, and, and it, it, it was just a re really out there. Uh, I think the, the writer's name is Russell Huban, uh, actually. And just like a very, um, like, I find it really interesting to see ways that people break down and weaponize, uh, in artistic ways, I should say, uh, the English language. And I think that that was like a really great example of that. Now, I, the next book that I'll read will be Mother Night by Kurt Vonnegut, uh, which I'm really excited for. And I, I really have a difficult time um, balancing uh, my reading between craft books and, and prose books, because I really enjoy uh, craft books. But, um, you know, oftentimes it's important to remember, like, these are these books are great, but also the the best way to learn about writing and um, and and is, is by is by reading the uh, the great authors who have come before us. And I think that you know reading is is also something that was kind of like a uh, that I rediscovered my love for during the pandemic. Um, but the best books are very much like a one on one dialogue between uh, between you and the author. And I think that in, in that respect, the books are very much like time machines. You know, there's something that live beyond us. Uh, there's something that, you know, as long as they uh, are still in, in publication, will will continue to, um, you know, to, to live beyond the, 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 pe the period of time that they were created. And so in that respect, the best way of traveling back in time is to uh, is to pick up a, a, a literary classic and really helps me get into into the mindset of these different uh, periods. What was the first book that ever made you cry? Good Night Moon, probably. Man, I'll tell you, there was, there was a comic that made me cry uh, uh, recently, which was issue nine of All-Star Superman. Um, it was, uh, it's, I think it's issue nine. It's the issue where uh, Clark comes back to Earth after he, he's been, he's rescued the uh, Bizarro universe. And there's two Kryptonians who have been there kind of like serving in Superman's role in, in his stead. Um, but they, their relationship with humans is not one of empathy. It's one of superiority. And, and, 
Clark hum, like humbles them, basically. Um, but the ending, the final two pages of that are real tear jerkers and, um, you know, tip of the cap to Grant Morrison and Frank White Lee for that one, because that one just pulled on my heartstrings so much. In fact, my, my fiance, Daniela, she, uh, her, her, um, relationship with Superman is, is relatively limited. She's more of a Batman uh, fan, much like myself. And so I actually showed her that book I, without giving her, you know, without burdening her with the entire run, uh, because that issue I think stands on its own two feet. I, I gave her that issue and I said, I think that to me, this is uh, the perfect encapsulation of the pathos of Superman and what makes him such an important character. And um, she kind of almost was moved to tears afterwards also. So I think she, she shared my sentiment. Between obviously the superheroes that you love and the superheroes that you haven't read yet, who would you like to read that you haven't given a chance to? Probably the flash. Oh. To be honest, I, um, I, I've read a lot of the, of the literary classics of, uh, Marvel characters and, um, many of the great Batman works as well. And now I'm starting to brush up on my most recent Batman stuff like, uh, Tom King. Oh. And, um, I'd like to start reading the James Tynan stuff also because I've heard great things. Um, but the flash is something is a character who I just have not read a single thing from. Um, and so I think that I'll probably start with the Mark Wade run on the character, uh, because I've been told, you know, I think that obviously one of Mark Wade's greatest feats, uh, as a writer is, um, getting down to what makes these heroes, uh, so important, uh, ideologically as, 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 as kind of characters, as, uh, like touching on their human, uh, sides and, um, I've been reading a lot of Mark Wade Daredevil recently, so I think that maybe I'll see uh, what his what his uh, take on the Flash is to kind of start my Flash uh, literacy. <laughs> what is the wisest thing someone's ever said to you? Wisest thing that someone has ever said to me is that it is not the things that you say yes to in life that defines you. It's what you say no to that defines you. What is one mistake that you'll never ever do again? Um, well, I think it would be, it's not so much one mistake, but it's more a, a, a something, a, a behavior that I fall into uh, often, and I hope never to make it again which is learning when to uh, be reactive, when, when, when to think fast and when to think slow, when to um, you know, go by my instinct and my gut reaction and when to take a more pragmatic approach, remove myself from a dilemma, give it a, give it a great deal of thought, scrutiny, um, uh, assess uh, different outcomes and then return to it uh, to uh, set about an act, like a, a course of action. What could you pay more attention to in your life? Well, it's, it's less what I could pay more attention to. It's more about what I could pay less attention to, which is my phone and, uh, you know, all the frivolous diversions that are encapsulated within. Um, I've like recently I've, uh, you know, because it's so funny because technology has afforded us with this, tremendous um device of productivity but and, and and connectivity but it's also given us um something that 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 is very interruptive in terms of how we go about our tasks how we think how we engage with uh with our friends and our our companions relationships um and so what i would like to do is really you know be more uh uh kind of decisive when I'm using my phone in terms of having a purpose uh, for why I'm opening it up. And, and with that free time that I will be kind of like allotting myself by limiting my, uh, my phone usage, then maybe I could start spending more uh, time doing, doing more things that I love, so spending more time with my fiance, for example, uh, you know, really like quality one-on-one -on -one time with, with, with limited distractions. 
um, spending more time writing as well. In one sentence, who are you? A jack of all trades. In one word, what do you live for? I live to create. Yeah, I live to. Um, I, I I live uh, to. I, I live to enjoy life, um, and but I also live to create things that I that I hope other people will enjoy, because I derive the most satisfaction from seeing other people enjoying themselves, um, and and so very very much like you know, uh, my my respective businesses. Uh, I've always been, you know, I, I build them for the audience of one. I, I, I build a space that I personally find that I would enjoy and I pour my love and, um, and my, my, my tastes, my inclinations, my interests into those. Uh, uh, so they've kind of become like li living and breathing embodiments of, uh, of, my, of my personality. But, but the real purpose is for other people to, uh, to derive enjoyment from them. Um, Thankfully, so far that, you know, many, many people have. And, um, you know, I feel really fortunate that uh, I've come to a, a point in my career where I'm never for want of, of more patrons or more customers. The spaces are very busy uh, on a nightly basis. And it's more so my, um, like, like I, can, I can then allot most of my professional time towards uh, uh, maintaining them um, and ensuring that you know, as time passes by, that the experience isn't uh, isn't diminished and doesn't lose its luster, um, doesn't become old hat, and 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 then likewise, I think that you know these these books and you know discovering the joy of writing and and uh, and and making something like a comic book, uh, which hopefully my you know friends and other people will uh, be inclined to pick up and read that that has been uh, like incredibly gratifying and rewarding as well. Um, yeah, just to be constantly creating. So. <laughs> Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Definitely my father. Yeah, my father was a, a big inspiration for me, Jack Mulqueen Sr. Uh, he was a Garmento uh, on 7th Avenue came from very limited means, high school dropout, and uh, went on to form a uh, fashion empire of sorts uh, during the 70s and 80s, was just incredibly prolific, um, almost like a larger than life figure. He had me very late. He was 47 years of age when he had me. So I was really born during kind of like the, the latter part of his career. And so a lot of the stuff lives on uh, in legend um, through, you know, tales that, uh, you know, seem larger than life that have been passed down to me from, uh, friends and acquaintances of his, um, every now and then it's funny. I'll actually have a friend send me, uh, a, uh, like an article of, co of, of clothing, like vintage clothing that appears in a vintage shop or at a thrift shop. Um, you know, these, these beautiful silk blouses, uh, that, have, that, that, that continue reappearing and his name is on the tag because the name of the company was Jack Volkman. So it's almost like every time he pops back up into my life, uh, it's kind of like his way of saying, you know, from up, from up there that, uh, he's still watching and, uh, and my mother too. And just, um, you know, the, the amount of love that the two had for each other. Um, and, uh, you know, she, uh, she, she, she passed that love down to me. So definitely my parents for sure. From a professional standpoint, you've created multiple businesses in the nightlife industry. You've now created two comic books, and I'm definitely sure you're going to create many more. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I it, it didn't come easy, you know. I, I failed upwards a few times, but uh, you know, I thankfully I'm in. I've, I've been in a position where. Where um, you know my businesses have enjoyed a, a great deal of success, and you know the pandemic obviously put uh, uh, through quite a wrench into that, but it was also um, an opportunity to experience uh, duress and hardships uh, on a professional scale, the likes of which I had never had before. Um, and so I find that you know iron sharpens iron, and uh, and, and I, I came out uh, from that you know, with a couple more calluses. So, uh, so that always helps. 
I do think that, you know, to quote Robert Frost, I have miles to go before I sleep. I think that the nightlife industry is definitely a young man's game. And so I've, you know, already, you know, despite the fact that I, I feel like right now I'm rounding into my prime right now as an operator, uh, begun kind of grooming some, uh, some protégés and some mentees, uh, you know, who I think have the right stuff. And, you know, I, I see opportunity down the line to, uh, to kind of continue um, my, like that, that side of my business portfolio. I have aspirations to open up a restaurant as well uh, sometime this year. So that's something that I've begun kicking the tires on, although I'm very conscious of not overburdening myself with launching too many projects at the same time, because I don't want them all to kind of suffer for it. Um, so it's, but, but, you know, really cool opportunities are starting to be thrown my way, which is uh, uh, very exciting. So starting to kind of, you know, like I mentioned earlier, saying, you know, the stuff that you say no to defining you, I just have to kind of train myself not to be too uh, uh, ambitious and uh, exercise restraint um, and be, and be picky, uh, I think is very important. Um, and likewise with uh with uh, the comic books, I mean, let's see, let's see where that goes. Um, you know, I feel really fortunate to be in a position where, um, you know, I have uh, income coming in uh, endemic, or I mean, rather, uh, uh, besides uh, the comic stuff where I can take my time writing um, and, and put, you know, nurture the projects, let them, kind of uh, uh, evolve and write themselves at their own pace. And um, I would like to, in, in a perfect world, uh, always have, um, you know, a new uh, writing project in the pipeline or rather at, at different states of, uh, of uh, development. Because I, right now, like with this project um, uh, being completed, I miss uh, getting in artwork uh, from, from, my, from my artists. Like that was such an exciting thing to wake up every morning and have a new page uh, sitting in your inbox. So in a perfect world, world I'll always have one book that's uh, one book that's being scripted, one book that's being sold, and one book that's in development. And that way, I can continuously uh, be enjoying uh, each part of that process and making new friendships in the comic space along the way. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, um, I think that whenever you fail, it's very important to, um, you know, you know, look the devil in the eye and, and be very honest with yourself. And, um, you know, once again, taking inventory of where things went wrong. Um, uh, and, and so almost like debriefing yourself uh, of sorts, seeing where things went wrong, uh, identifying them, and then making a solemn vow to yourself to never make those mistakes again. I think failure is very important. Uh, I saw, you know, uh, a coach, a, a basketball coach in a post-game interview the other day said, if you're not winning, you're learning. And I found that like a, a pretty interesting idiom that we learn from our failures more so than we learn from our successes. Successes reinforce uh, uh, good habits uh and failures eradicate bad ones so uh i think if failing is an important part of the process um i think it's important to be a good listener and and learn from the mistakes of your mentors um nurturing mentors i find for any industry is a very important thing because um you know the wisdom uh in in respective fields gets passed down uh from generation to generation uh to willing listeners so uh, that's kind of what I've, what I've started imparting to my mentees and, and my protégés is like, you know, I, I'll be an open book to you and uh, avail myself to you for any questions that I have. I've made a great deal of mistakes. Um, I've failed in nightlife uh, just about any way that you could possibly imagine. So learn from, learn from my mistakes and, uh, and hopefully, you know, you won't make too many of your own. You kind of hit upon the topic that your mentees are looking up to you for guidance, answers, the business acumen that they need to succeed in their own professional lives. But you're also showcasing your comic books to the younger generation of comic creators themselves. And they're going to be inspired to be creative however they want to be creative. 
how can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, I think that, um, you know, uh, a creative effort, uh, endeavor that isn't burdened by monetary realities will always be the purest form of, uh, of, of artistic and creative expression. Um, and so, you know, despite the fact that, that I would like to, um, to, to turn my writing into a, you know, a lucrative, uh, uh, career, um, for, for this project, I, I, I came in with very realistic expectations in terms of, you know, what kind of monetary impact, uh, it, it could potentially have from, from, uh, from, a uh, an income and revenue standpoint. Um, and, and I, and I kind of wrote it off, uh, from, from the onset because it's like I said, like that, that to me, the value of producing this was not, uh, dollars and cents. It was about, uh, personal gratification. And then also to show myself that I could complete, uh, a, a comic. And, and so I guess like my, like it, were I to speak to them, I would say, um, there's that old there's that old expression that filmmakers have one for me one for them uh and i think that that's kind of like a great uh adage that anybody can adopt to their life that you know we do um you know uh, being fiscally responsible is an important uh, and intrinsic aspect of all of our lives and so you know we do what we must to kind of uh uh survive because um uh, I read in a book the other day that uh, money money doesn't buy you happiness, but um, but poverty uh, can can bring upon you sadness, and so and so it's more so about um, you know professionally getting yourself to a place where you can kind of sustain. Um, I digress. Uh, basically, that that I would just encourage them to kind of create. Uh, from the mindset of like, like put less importance on commercial viability and put more importance on, on your own happiness. Um, and, and that, that I think that good, that, that that's where, that's where your truest form of expression will come from and that people will ultimately respond to the offering if it's genuine and heartfelt uh, which in turn they will want to, want to to purchase it and support it. So, when I told my friends that I was that I was going to start writing a comic book, I mean, some of them were like, "Huh," and some of them were like, very supportive and said, "That's that's great," and I will buy a copy on day one. Um, and 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 so I just you know I'm always thinking about you know how can I how can I pay that forward and return that uh return that support to all, all of my friends creative endeavors if they're opening a, a matcha company if they're if they're jarring their own nut butter like whatever it might be like send me the link and i will be the first one to purchase it because i think that like like i love that kind of stuff you know i think that we should all be um you know listen to, to ourselves listen to our passions what are our passions telling us and uh and that's a, that's something that I think that you can think very reactively on. Uh, and my passion told me you need to write a comic. Um, and you know, six months later, I'm I'm holding it in my hand. And when I unboxed it, that that was a moment that I allowed myself uh, a solitary tear because um, it just like was the most immense uh, feeling of accomplishment. And I I hope that everybody gets to kind of like experience that in their lifetime, whatever brings them that joy uh, that I that I experienced that day, so. Well, I hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Jack. But before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and how can we support you online? Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's at two, the number two, percent, Mulk, M-U-L-Q. Uh, on Instagram, it's at incredible mulk. It's kind of like a play on words for incredible Hulk, but, uh, but with my surname, uh, and, and on Kickstarter. But if you go on the Twitter, on the Instagram, uh, the Kickstarter link will be there. I think I have like 24 days left, uh, for the nightlife noir campaign where, you know, fortunately we've, uh, we've already reached our funding goal and, um, 
but I would love to uh, get get this book out into uh, as many comic book lover fans, uh, comic book lovers' hands uh, as possible. And you know, certainly, um, yeah, give me a shout. Give me a shout on Instagram. Give me a shout on Twitter. It's always nice to meet fellow uh, fellow geeks and you know, pop culture enthusiasts. Be it comics, movies, TV. I love just consuming all sorts of pop culture and and talking. And likewise. Uh, if you ever find yourself in New York City, um, you know, it's it's uh, I, I'd be thrilled to invite you for a drink. So to anybody out there who's based in New York, uh, I'm a very easy man to find. <laughs> well, New York Comic Con is definitely on my list of, of conventions to visit uh, for sure. San Diego, of course, is the other one. Um, definitely, you know, geek culture. You have to visit at least those two once in your life. Uh, plus, I've never been to New York, so I definitely want to be there. So it'd be great to have you as a as a guy to show me the big apple. Uh, but I definitely want to say, you know, this is an amazing book. I can't wait to see what else you come up with and create in the future. And thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. And I want to help support you as best as I can um, by promoting the Kickstarter and by also showcasing where they can find you on, on your social media and your website. So thank you so much again, Jack, for coming on the show. Awesome, Kurt. Thanks for having me. And I just wanted to say, you know, on behalf of uh, uh, everyone who you you have availed yourself to, uh, thank you for uh, uh, fighting the good fight and, and putting forward this show, uh, you know, using your time to uh, empower and uplift uh, creators of all different varieties. Uh, you really, I mean, just even the way that the, that the show is structured in terms of how one registers uh, um, and, and elects uh, uh, of their own volition to, uh, to participate and, and sit down in conversation with you. Uh, I, we, need, we need more of that uh, in this world. And so, um, you know, the time uh, that you take to do your research and prepare for these interviews, uh, and then obviously the time that you spend uh, producing them and sitting down in conversation, it, it allows, uh, you know, young and burgeoning creators like myself to uh, you know, hopefully get out and, and reach other people. So I just wanted to say thank you for having me on and I'm sure on behalf of many others, uh, thank you for, for, for putting this podcast forward. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I just want to thank Jack for coming on the show. Uh, it's an amazing book. Check it out, as I said before. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring it out. Thank you for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talk. Hey, all Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.